Today, the United States is considered among the most powerful nations in the world. It gets involved in many global conflicts by giving weapons, money, and sometimes sending troops to fight in certain areas. As a result, current and former members of the military play a vital role in American life. But this was not always the case. Before World War II, the American public was reluctant to support involvement in global conflicts and alliances, preferring isolationist policies. In today's lesson, we explore how World War II and the Cold War affected public opinion and government policies toward the military and the rest of the world. The guiding questions are, how did public opinion and domestic policy toward veterans and the military change? Why did the public support a interventionist United States foreign policy? Today's less than essential question is, how did changes in public opinion influence government policy at home and abroad during the post-World War II period? Okay, grab your compass. It's time to explore. Before we get going, let's jump back to the end of World War I. World War I was not supported by many in the United States. And once it was over, the military and many of its weapons and ships were literally taken apart and scrapped. The public did not support maintaining a large military during peacetime. Instead, the public wanted a return to isolationist policies which meant there was no need for a big, expensive military. This lack of support for the military translated into a lack of government support for World War I veterans. There were no policies that addressed the injuries and other difficulties returning soldiers faced. In contrast to World War I, the intense war effort at home and Allied victory in World War II created a strong sense of patriotism in the United States. But the government had helped direct public opinion by producing numerous posters and radio messages during the war. Take a look at this poster. The caption says, We shall win or we shall die. How do you think this poster impacted public opinion? People felt they were a major part of the most important fight for democracy the world had ever seen, which created a strong sense of patriotism in the country. As the war ended, this patriotism meant the public supported all sorts of new policies meant to help returning soldiers. For example, the federal government passed the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, commonly known as the GI Bill. This law offered veterans home and business loans, college tuition, and job training. It also offered rehabilitation services for disabled veterans to help them re-enter the workforce. Public support for veterans was followed by changing public opinions toward the military as a whole. As the Cold War began, the public started to view military power as the main source of American influence in the world, which made the military an important institution at home. Across the United States, military bases became important to local communities and their economy. The GI Bill and broad public support for the military enticed many young people to enlist in the armed forces as a way of moving up in society. Since the war, generations of Americans have joined the military and received training in many different technical fields. This has helped them further their careers once their service is over. After World War II and during the Cold War, the military was one of the major institutions in American society. Since then, the U.S. has maintained a large peacetime military to secure its larger role in global affairs. Before we discuss this big change, let's answer the first guiding question. 
How did public opinion and domestic policy toward veterans and the military change? In this section, we'll examine some topics and images that depict some of humanity's worst behavior, such as atomic warfare and the Holocaust. But it's important not to forget the past as we make sure not to repeat it. Let's start by going back to the end of World War I and the public's opinion on foreign policy. After the war, the League of Nations was created as a multinational group designed to prevent future wars. But the United States Senate rejected the League because many Americans did not support joining it, preferring a return to isolationism. However, the idea for an international peace organization was brought back after World War II with the creation of the United Nations. And this time, the majority of the American public supported the United Nations and the U.S.'s leading role in it. In general, the public supported a more interventionist foreign policy, meaning the U.S. government was expected to involve itself in issues around the world. This shift occurred for a few reasons. World War II had caused so much death and destruction. The USSR was spreading communism to more and more places around the world. And nuclear warfare had become a real possibility. The first reason the public supported an interventionist foreign policy was the death and destruction caused by World War II. Humanity went through two world wars, the Holocaust and a global depression. Millions had died and suffered. Many hoped an American-led United Nations would ensure global peace, preventing another world war. The second reason the public supported an interventionist foreign policy was the spread of communism. The USSR was supporting communist revolutions around the world, which expanded its global economic and political control. To many Americans, this posed a threat to capitalism and democracy worldwide, including at home, which justified interventionist policies. For example, the United States led the creation of a defense organization in Europe called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, or NATO for short. Unlike the United Nations, the USSR and other communist nations were not members. Instead, it was made up of only European capitalist and democratic nations with the sole purpose of stopping the spread of communism. The third reason people supported an interventionist foreign policy was the nuclear arms race. By the end of the 1940s, the USSR had developed nuclear weapons, so now the world was divided into two camps, each with the most advanced destructive weapons on Earth. People worried that another world war would lead to global annihilation. It was clear to many that isolationist policies could no longer keep the nation safe. More and more, the public supported interventionist policies to extend America's power and resist communism. Public support and the government's commitment to a more active foreign policy was proven by the Korean War. When the USSR-backed regime in North Korea invaded US-backed South Korea, President Harry S. Truman sent military forces to help South Korea. The goal was to stop the spread of communism in Asia. Truman referred to American military involvement in Korea as a police action instead of a war. This description as a police action helped to justify a series of proxy wars around the world as a way to stop the spread of communism. A proxy war is a conflict where two or more powerful nations support and often manipulate a third country rather than directly engaging in battle themselves. The Korean War demonstrated that the majority of the American public would only support politicians who were tough on communism and willing to use the military to prove it. Let's answer our final guiding question. Why did the public support a interventionist United States foreign policy?
patriotism for the military and a more globally active United States government led to changes in the way the public viewed the treatment of veterans. World War II's level of destruction, the spread of communism, and the threat of nuclear war also changed the public's view of the U.S.'s role in global affairs. Today, the United States is expected to intervene in conflicts around the world, leading many to view the nation as a global police force. But moving forward, it's going to be up to you to decide just how the United States continues to make history. Hey, hey.